Good uh, morning and warm welcome to everyone who is connecting uh, both in London, the UK and across the whole world as well. My name is uh, Professor Crawford Spence. I'm an academic in the business school and also Vice Dean for Corporate Relations. Um, and I do research into financial markets uh, and asset management largely. So it's quite relevant today that I'm introducing uh, Dr. Sakar Nusebe. Today's webinar will see about 30 minutes or so presentation by Dr. Nusebe, followed by more or less 20 minute Q&A, which uh, will be chaired by myself. So I'll now introduce the speaker. And we're very grateful today to have Dr. Sakar Nusebe, who's CEO of the International Business of Federated Hermes. Uh, while Sakar has had a long and successful career in asset management, he originally had aspirations to be an academic, graduating from King's with a, a BA and a PhD in medieval history. I'm not sure there are many people working in the asset management or finance industry of PhDs in medieval history. Um, but Sakar was just telling me before we, we logged on this morning that he almost went to war studies as well. But Sakar had the good fortune to study eventually under the supervision of the, the renowned historian Dame Jinty Nelson, who I believe also tried to lure him back to academia for several years after he had started his career in the city. While this was not to be, Sakar has established a scholarship in honour of Jinte to support the next generation of medievalists. Uh, Sakar is the founder of the 300 Club and was an inaugural member of the Chartered Financial Analysts Institute Future of Finance Advisory Council from 2013 until 2019. He's a member of the IIRC Council, the FCA PRA Climate Financial Risk Forum, the United Nations Environmental Programme Financial Initiative Steering Committee, the Banking Standards Board, the list goes on, the UK National Advisory Board on Impact Investing and the Advisory Board of the National Youth Orchestra, just in case he wasn't busy enough. In 2018, Sakar was named CEO of the Year at the Financial News Asset Management Europe Awards and was awarded a CBE as a Commander of the Order of the British Empire, for those who don't know, in the Queen's 2019 New Year's Honours list for his um, services to responsible business and finance. And in this webinar, Sakar will discuss how the landscape of financial services is changing and why organisations need to embrace sustainable investment strategies now more than ever. He'll investigate why ESG, so it's environmental and social governance, is essential from both an individual and a business perspective, explore how the current pandemic has thrown a spotlight on this area and explain why a socially responsible approach is fundamental for all institutions. So during Sacker's presentation, just a few housekeeping points. Those of you who are on Zoom will be able to use the Q&A feature of the platform to submit your questions online. You'll be able to find the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. When you open it, you'll be able to write questions and also see everyone else's questions. Uh, we're really pleased to have such a good turnout, but as a result, we may not be able to answer all of your questions. So we encourage you to participate by maybe upvoting someone else's questions or liking some questions you'd like to be answered in the, in the second part of the webinar. Questions which receive the most likes will appear at the top of the Q&A window, um, so it's a democratic process. So you won't see questions by chronological order, necessarily. So make sure to scroll up to see which questions have the most likes. We'll then select the most asked asked questions to be posed to our panelists following the discussion. Now, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sakar Nusebe for this morning's discussion. Uh, so Sakar, over to you. And as, a, as we discussed earlier, about five minutes towards the end, I will jump in and you'll hear me shouting five minute warning or something to that effect. Perfect. Uh, Professor Crawford, thank you so much indeed for such a kind introduction. And uh, Louisa and Hannah, thank you for organizing this. And to all of you joining in, thank you for sparing. But I hope um, to give you an idea of how I think um, it is inevitable that the financial system should adapt and why I think uh, not only is it inevitable, this is how it was designed uh, to be done uh, in the beginning. Uh, and just before we start that, I just want to make um, three separate points and then we'll start the charts going. Uh, the first point is that when we talk about finance and the financial system, uh, all of us use this very odd uh, mental methodology. Uh, in our own minds, we create three separate worlds. Um, we say that there is something out there called um, the space where we live as citizens. 
Uh, and in that space where we live as citizens, for those of us who live in Western Europe or for those of us who live in the United States, uh, we think that we have power through the way that we vote in governments to spend our taxations or not. But that is essentially the realm of government, of, 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 of regulators, of, uh, and, and, and it's where we interact as, as political beings within society. Then there's the sort of other sphere that we think of as being separate, which is where we actually live uh, our day-to-day -day lives. It is where we go and find a job. It is the companies we work for. It is the companies we buy from. It's the companies that as business people we supply to and so on. And then somehow we think there's this other world over here that's called the financial world. Uh, and we think that that's entirely separate. And a lot of the discussion, uh, particularly since the 70s, about shareholder rights and shareholder values assumes that the people in this third world are entirely separate from all these other two sections of the world, or these third segment of the world are separate. And in reality, I would argue that if you were to do a Venn diagram and you put them one on top of the other, there's a huge amount of overlap between them. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, uh, of the 70 or 80 trillion uh, dollars of world savings, mostly savings by uh, the developed economies of these 70 or 80 trillion uh, dollars of world savings, which by the way, control um, uh, the banks and the other financial institutions, which actually produce a lot of the rest of the capital that's being generated, 250 trillion, whatever it is, that makes up the entire capital of the world. Most of that is actually owned widely amongst those of us who save, whether it is by 401ks in America, whether it is by pension funds, whether it's savings uh, and, and insurance savings money. So there's actually a lot of us who collectively, individually, we own tiny bits of companies, but collectively, we in fact own the financial system. And at the same time, we are the uh, the, the, the workers who work within the companies that, that we own. We are the customers who buy from the companies that we own. We are the suppliers who supply to the companies that we own. So in fact, it's one and the same. And of course, we live in the countries where the regulations are put uh, to control these activities and we vote in the governments that control them. And that is very important. And that leads me to the second point. And the second point is um, that uh, there is this belief uh, somehow uh, that um, uh, the world now needs to change. Uh, what COVID has done is it had, had completely imprinted on people the idea that the system as it is does need to change. And, and allow me two points on COVID. The first point is that um, the, the belief that the world has got to change started with, with the idea of global warming and that the system quite doesn't work and the increasing integration of ESG. So what's happened is as citizens, we are demanding from our governments to force a change in the way we invest. And that's why the law is changing in Europe. But also, uh, uh, as citizens in the midst of the crisis, we did something which I think is absolutely unique and people are not thinking enough about it, uh, which is we as a society have said, listen, we don't care if we lose economic returns. We genuinely don't care. We value something else more. We call this holistic returns. We value citizens' lives. And we're willing to take a 10 or 20 or 30% hit to GDP because we value citizens' lives. This is a massive change. So the idea that the rational outcome of what we do is simply to invest uh, for maximizing returns, we as a society have said no to. So keep these in mind as we discuss uh, the next slide. Now, let's start with my presentation. I'll take you through um, the, the different ways that you can invest and why I think integrating ESG, uh, environmental, social, and governance concern, and sustainability and holistic returns as total outcomes for the total of society is the only way that you can, in fact, invest rationally. That this does link to, in fact, Adam Smith, uh, who is deeply misunderstood in my view. And why, in fact, there is no contradiction between pursuing ultimately economic financial growth and doing what's good. Being good actually is, is good business and is rational business. So if we could start with the charts, Louisa, and I can't control them, which is wonderful because I'm no good at technology. So let's start with this. Uh, yeah, no, we can go to the next chart. That's it. Now, a lot of people think that um, when we talk about markets, you'll notice a lot of people talk about trading. We trade in markets. Um, and uh, there's nothing wrong with trading. Uh, but if you listen to the stuff that was 
that, that, that um, the news outlets talk about, and they'll say the market went up or down by X percent, you know, we made money, the market. This is speculation. It's, it's not investing. It's, it's, it's trading. Um, uh, during the COVID crisis, my family and I uh, have a ritual now where every night we watch a, a program of Poirot. And for those who follow the Poirot program, it's quite old now for most of you. There's a character in it uh, who is called Captain Hastings who speculates. This is speculation. And if you look at how most people want to invest in the markets, they think that they will trade the stocks. Buy low, sell high is what they'll see and so on. It's fine. But actually, the evidence suggests that if you try to simply trade in the markets, if that's how you're going to make money to retire, because the whole point of savings is you're saving for your retirement and for the time when you stop working, then your success ratio is not very good. The hit ratio is only 36%. That's the amount of active people who are active in the market, active managers who manage to outperform. There is another way that you can do it if you really want to gamble, because what these people are doing is they are essentially betting. Trading is simply another word for betting. They're betting that the economy is going to grow or going to shrink. They're betting that the company is going to grow its profits by doing this or that. It's simply betting. Uh, it's a bit like betting in a casino. Well, if you are going to put your entire life savings in bettings, if the purpose of the financial market, as the misunderstood Chicago school says, is simply to increase financial return, that's the law in America, by the way. Fiduciary law is that the only purpose for investing is to increase financial return. If that is the case, then trading active management in the market does not work. What does work is shown in the next chart. These are all academic studies, by the way. In fact, what it does show uh, is that poker players in Las Vegas, professional poker players, have a better hit ratio, 55%, than traders at 36%. So if the objective of investing is simply to maximize returns, then in reality, we shouldn't invest in stock markets at all. We shouldn't create capital. We shouldn't invest in the economies. What we should do is go to Las Vegas. It's a lot more fun. Hire a poker player and have them, in fact, um, play on our behalf. But clearly, we don't do that. Because investing is not just about maximizing returns. Investing, I would argue, is about creating a, a, an ecosystem, an economic ecosystem, that grows in which we can retire and which we can hand off to the next generation. And that is the difference. And it's all to do with time. If you are going to invest for the long term, you cannot do so by betting. If you're going to invest for the long term, you have to understand the companies that you invest in and you have to become a responsible owner. Let's play a thought experiment. If you were to have, and let's leave it on this stock for now because that's the right stock, the right, right chart. No, no, go to the next chart. That's fine. Sorry, Louisa. Thank you. Let's play a thought experiment. If you were to put your entire life savings into one company that you were the sole owner worker in, and that's your whole life, you will ensure, first and foremost, that you knew the business that you're in really well. You will ensure, in fact, that you uh, have a sustainable business. You will ensure that your customers are pleased with you at all times. You will ensure that you're not overcharging for what you're doing. You'll ensure that your supply chain that you're buying from is secure, sustainable. You'll ensure that your community accepts you so that the regulator doesn't come and, and take you out of business. That's how you do it logically if you put all of your wealth in one company that you worked in and you would want to own that company forever because it's all that you own. If you expand that to investment, we would argue the only way that you can invest in a logical way is if you apply these same methodologies right across the board to all companies that you invest in. And that's why we think if you are going to invest as opposed to simply bet, then the answer to the first two charts that I showed you is not that you go to beta index or index investing, but actually you go to high active share investing. And high active share investing is simply having fewer portfolios that you know much, much better. And all of this chart shows is that if you do so, in fact, the academic evidence is you have a better chance of doing better than the rest of the market. And that's based on, uh, on a lot of work done uh, by, uh, uh, by uh, the University of uh, Notre Dame. Uh, 
the guitar is meant to be a Gibson, but I'm not allowed to say it's a Gibson because I don't have the trademark for it. And the point is that the guitars are, are very unique and playing music on the guitar is, if you're into lead music, because if you are better musicians than I am, you know, it's not having lots of notes. It's actually playing with a few notes and making it last. Listen to May if you're into it and, and you'll see the difference. So the reality is sustainability is how logically you do it if it's your own money. We'd argue it's logically how you do it if, if you're investing um, a, a wider portfolio for others. And it's the only way that investment works. Now, asset management is a conduit between you as owners and between the companies. And go back to the first point I made right before we started the charts, when I said that there's this overlap between us as owners of companies and employees of companies, consumers from the companies and so on. And so it is in our interest as owners to ensure two things. One, the businesses that we invest in are in fact sustainable because that gives us the better return. Well, think about it. That's also in our interest, by the way, as employees, because we want to make sure that the companies are there for us to work for. We want to make sure that the stakeholders are best served. Why? Because we're both employees and customers. Actually, it's more than both. We are all employees and customers and owners at the same time. And so the only way that we can be an efficient conduit is if you use our, ourselves and take your money as, as investors and, in fact, apply them as responsible owners and behave not so much that we're buying and selling pieces of paper in the stock market, that's the betting, the trading angle, but in fact behave as responsible owners as if it were the one business that we own. And if we do that, what we end up creating is a world in which we have a better outcome for you as an investor, for you as an employee, as a customer, as a supplier, and for you as a citizen, because it's all interrelated. It's all interrelated. And let me, uh, um, again, take a slightly controversial point. Controversial, it's not really, but the way I talk about it is controversial. We all believe in diversity, right? Everybody talks about gender diversity. And everybody goes out of the way to try to justify why the gender diversity actually makes sense. Now, I find the justification to be complete nonsense. I find it to be complete nonsense for two reasons. The first one is, as a CEO, I'm in the business of trying to buy um, labor, unit labor costs at the lowest possible uh, cost, pos uh, the lowest cost possible. I don't understand why I wouldn't have a full supply line because if I don't believe in gender diversity, I've half my supply line. So actually, not to believe in gender diversity in companies is just economically stupid. But there's another reason, which is I am also an employee of companies. So are my daughters, and so is my wife, and. Sorry, how do I not want companies to give me, because half of me, meaning half of me as, a, as an investor is women anyway, so half the owners are women, or me as somebody who, who has daughters, how do I not want companies to be fully diversified from a gender perspective, because that then harms me. And that's the point. The harm and the good that companies do to you as an investor, are not just related to how much money they make. When we say that the objective of investment is to get actually, and, and the objective of the 70 trillion is to invest to make enough money for us to be able to retire, that's a heuristic. It's a heuristic for saying that the objective is simply to allow us to retire better. But that means we have to build this ecosystem that actually we live in. More than that, it shapes the world that we live in. Shall we go to the next slide? It shapes the world that we live in because companies have a lot of power. Companies have a lot of power. Companies have a lot of power about the way we live. They have a lot of power about uh, the way that they affect our system. And companies, if they behave badly, in fact, can affect us all. And I'm just checking the time. So very briefly, I'm going to go through the E, the S, and the G and tell you why companies should pay attention and should integrate all three. Now, let's start with the G, governance. Governance is that structure that allows us as owners to ensure, uh, us, by the way, I mean collectively, all of us, everybody who listens to this, all the savers in the world, to ensure that we're protecting our interests from CEOs who might be well-meaning but might do the wrong thing. That's the whole point of governance. So, of course, you should, in fact, control it. Let me give you an example. In the heyday of the 2000s, when the markets were running up, the markets were being driven by the creation of financial derivatives, uh, primarily by banks. And there was a lack of governance. 
because we as owners did not go to the banks and say, um, hang on a minute, the return on equity that you're creating is more than normal. It is abnormally high. You must be taking abnormally high risk. Now, go back to the one company idea. If uh, my daughter were to start a business and I suddenly saw that her profits would go massively up, I'd worry that perhaps it's illegal. That's the first thing I'd worry about. And then the second thing is say to her, what kind of risk are you taking with the capital? Because you're not meant to make money that quickly. Just the world is not that good. Now, because we didn't do that, because we didn't do that, what happened was the bank's shares went up. The banks created a lot more capital, but they ultimately created the conditions for the collapse of 2008. And the collapse of 2008 did not just affect the investors. They infected the whole of society. We had to suffer from government cutbacks in spending and, addition, and lost GDP growth and additional uh, uh, and additional debts. If you're a UK citizen like me, then on a very, very crude basis, the financial crisis costs you, in addition to everything else, the loss in GDP growth and everything, about £16,000 of additional debt. That's the lack of governance. So how can you not incorporate governments that protect society and the investors and indeed the CEOs themselves from making mistakes? Sustainability, I'm not going to argue about too much because I don't understand how you can have a business which is not sustainable. That is just nonsense. Go to Las Vegas, have fun, play poker. And environmental damage. Now, in Europe, we take it for granted um, that environmental issues are important. But, but um, in North America, it's a bit more controversial. But, but look, the fact is that environmental concerns have always been there. And, and we've known about them for a long time. And they're not just about global warming. Uh, in London, we have Lloyds of London, the, the, uh, the insurance market. Lloyds of London, in fact, managed to survive uh, the, uh, the American War of Independence and the separation of the colonies, uh, the Crimean War, uh, the First World War, the Second World War, and it was brought down to its knees by asbestos. So they might, it might be a risk that only comes along every now and then, but it has a massive impact. And if you don't think that environmental warning is important, uh, environmental issues are important, then you're living in a different world. Insurance companies already, in fact, believe it. So how do you deal with that? That means that you cannot simply treat your investments or treat the business that you, uh, that, that you invest in as yes, no. Yes, they're doing the right thing. No, they're not doing the right thing because it's not true. Nobody wakes up in the morning, whether in business or investment world or in companies and goes, Today, I will be evil. That's not how the world works. People, in fact, try to do the right thing. So the key to investment is to be an investor, which is to be an owner. And the key to be an owner is to have long-term discussions with companies that you hold on behalf of all these people that own it, collectively society, to have this long-term discussion about integrating the E, the S, and the G, and about responsible behavior, because responsible behavior ensures that we have an outcome that is financially viable and which is good for the whole of society. And that is the key. It's the only way forward. Let's go for the next chart. No, we'll go for So this is just proving to you that charts will be available, I'm sure. This is just showing to you that if you do this, you're not just not a feel-good factor. In fact, you become a more efficient business. And we have proven this through studies we've conducted ourselves at Hermes and studies that we have conducted with others. And I, I didn't start by telling you that for 30 years we've been pursuing this. Um, seven odd years ago, um, the Financial Times ran a, 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 a feature about us and about me, and they kindly called me a hippie. Uh, nowadays, everybody believes in this because actually it makes better business sense. Sorry, right, next chart. Next chart. This all tells you that you make money out of doing what I just said. This is an interesting chart, so let's leave it. In fact, what this shows, which is a top line, is that companies that you engage with, companies that you have a dialogue with as an owner, and not simply buy and sell, companies that listen to you, because these are companies that have listened to us, about integrating sustainability factors, good governance practice, good environmental practice, companies that think in terms of holistic returns and outcomes to markets, do outperform their peers. So we go back, it is inevitable. The next one. And let's go off the charts and I'll speak to you and I'm almost out of time, I've got five minutes. So let's take out the charts. So look, 
This was a trot through in trying to explain to you that people who talk about ESG and responsible investing, it appears to many that in fact, this is a new thing that has come to the marketplace. And that is a trend that has started over the last 10 years and gathered momentum. It is certainly a trend in asset management in that seven years ago, uh, we were a lone voice, pretty much. I mean, there were others, but we were a lone voice. 30 years ago, certainly, we were a lone voice. And now it's a crowded market because there's a demand for it. COVID increases this demand because people understand that the world of finance and the world we live in and the world of government are all one and the same in the inter interlaced. But I want to end it with one point. In fact, this has always been the case. And people who understand economics and understand the free market have always understood this. Now, everybody goes and quotes Adam Smith at you and the invisible hand of markets. And Adam Smith um, was, in fact, um, I think a very boring writer. I mean, he wrote wonderfully, but I think he's just a very boring writer um, because he wrote in a particular style uh, that is now out of favor, uh, which is an eight, you know, 18th century Scottish style. And most people will go to his book about markets, and most people don't bother reading what he wrote beforehand, um, and he wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And in fact, Adam Smith based his understanding of how the free market works in this idea of the theory of moral sentiments, and I will end by reading for you uh, from this, uh, and it's a very short extract from what he wrote. He's talking about the rational person. And by the way, nobody does financial decisions based on rationality. And I'm willing to challenge anybody who's listening to me whether that's the case or not. Um, the biggest single financial investment we ever make is a house. I've never heard of anybody buying a house based on a spreadsheet. They normally say to me they bought the house because the garden looks nice or has a good aspect or I can afford it. Second most expensive thing we do is we buy a car. Nobody buys it because they've done a spreadsheet on the cost benefit analysis of going to work. What they do is they say if they're a bloke, it's red, it goes vroom, vroom. Uh, or they say it's comfortable and convenient. Anyway, but let's assume there is a rational man, or rational person, sorry. He was a sexist because he's a man of his time. Let's assume there is a rational being who is the basis of this free market that we talk about. This is what Adam Smith said about the rational being. He is sensible too that his own interest is connected with the prosperity of society. The interest of the rational person is connected with the prosperity, meaning the wealth of society, not his, society, stakeholders. And that the happiness, perhaps the preservation, the preservation of his existence, his very being, his very being able to be alive and being happy, being content in his livelihood, depends upon its preservation, meaning the preservation of the wealth of society. Adam Smith understood that for the system to work, you need an understanding of stakeholder society, and you need to have a system that produces outcomes that actually are beneficial to all stakeholders. Certainly for the last 30 or 40 years, there's been this misunderstanding in financial markets that that is not the case, and that the way to do your duty as an investor, and therefore do your duty as a CEO, is to maximize returns financially for your shareholders. I hope through this very quick trot through, I've shown you that in fact, through our practice, we have shown that is not the case. We've shown that to in fact invest with an, uh, a stakeholder outlook gets you better financial outcomes in the long term anyway.